Hello, welcome to another Polymathy podcast. I'm Luke, and here I'm accompanied by some of the authors working on this incredible project, the third edition, the third book in the series of uh, illustrated graphic novels or comic books, if you like to call them, in Latin, originally in Latin. And this is truly amazing, learning about Maxentius, Emperor Maxentius. And here today we have Francesco and Sonia as well as Diego. So glad to have you again on the cha- on the channel, and Diego for the first time. So uh, if you're, this is these are a little bit of the images that we'll see a bit more of today from this incredible comic book uh, or graphic novel. Here, let me take this down for a second, just to show that I have, of course, the second one that they released by New Base. That's this group, New Base. And uh, this one's was the uh, Medaille Daimones that came out last year. And uh, uh, Francesco, could you tell us a little bit about what this um, next project is about that you're working on? Sure. Uh, thanks, Luke, Luke, for uh, your hospitality. Hello, everyone. And yes, this is um, our third book after Origines Picta at, and uh, Medaille Daimones. And uh, with this book, uh, we try to explore uh, new, new territories uh, because the first book was um, a collection of sh- uh, short stories. The second one, an original tragedy written by um, Stefano Vittori. And with the third book, we choose to, to, to tell uh, a life. And uh, we can say there is a parallel between uh, uh, our, uh, our job in, in Nubes and uh, our uh, choose about Maxentius because Latin is a language uh, in which we base our comics that is about to be rediscovered. And uh, also Maxentius is um, an historical figure uh, that was uh, forgotten and maybe uh, misinterpreted for about uh, almost a thousand years. And now um, they're emerging new studies, thanks to Diego Serra and Marco Cecini, uh, which tell us an um, all new story about him. Uh, so why not, uh, not tell th- this story in a fashionable way uh, through images? Oh. But fashionable is absolutely uh, the word, and beautiful. And uh, Diego, wonderful to have you uh, on the channel. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your role in the realization of this project? Sure. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm a researcher in uh, Roma law, uh, laws of ancient Mediterranean, and I coordinated the interdisciplinary team that studied uh, uh, Maxentius and Diocletian's edicts for the first time in two preliminary books and one article. Um, in 2023, I submitted, I submitted to EU funding institutions a project based on such works uh, uh, that scored 4.10 of 5 in project in project set. Excellence. Mm. Mm. Wow. Well, well, yeah. Well, I want to talk more about the the Roman uh, law in particular because that especially uh, has has fascinated me. Uh, it's the, which we and we actually, of course, did a, uh, a video, a uh, brief interview with uh, with Francesco and uh, Stefano Vittori on uh, my other channel, Scorpio Martianos, in Latin. So go go check that out if you want to get some Latin comprehensible input. And that's something that I definitely see here. Something that we talk about often on this channel and uh, and the other is the importance of input that is the only way that one really acquires a language is through input and you have to comprehend what's going on and there's essentially no better way than through images especially something that is interesting and involves a narrative so you have all these things together in one beautiful thing because basically you're doing two things at once in my view you are creating some for for example i'm a latin speaker i'm sure i will learn new Latin vocabulary, especially since the, the translator was Stefano Vittori for this project. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sure I'll, I'll learn uh, plenty of new things. But even if I didn't, this is essentially content made for me as a Latin speaker and for other Latin speakers that I know who are a part of um, my audience. Um, that's great. But also, it serves the goal of creating input that is readily comprehensible here. You know, of course, we see, aha, 
we recognize these images, or right? these locations, roughly. Maybe some of us do. If we don't, then we'll learn all about them. And the colors are beautiful and simulating, and we ha see the, the scene layout. I mean, just little things like this. I'd love to talk to you both, Sonia and Francesca, about how you determine the layout of these kinds of things. But before we do that, I want to uh, as mention, of course, the this is a project that isn't yet fully realized because it's a Kickstarter right now. And so uh, it's, of course, quite certain that given Nubase's success with already producing books, that if you want to purchase uh, this, you'll be able to. But if you're like me and you want it sooner, then you can, you can, you know, I, I did that myself. I, I uh, supported um, the, uh, the previous Kickstarters. Of course, I know the, the content creators, so I knew that they're going to come with good things. And I got my signed copy and everything, a special <laughs> illustration. Those are similar things that are available in this Kickstarter. Is that, uh, is that right, Francesco? Yes. Uh, we are offering, um, as usual, uh, the digital book, the um, paper book, and then uh, a lot of uh, extra content like the um, dedicated copy, the sketched copy, or even a um, 3D reconstruction of the Basilica of Maxentius, mm. and even the possibility, uh, ah, sure, the illustration, the illustration from Lorenzo Gubinelli, the, the, the uh, personalized commission from the, the, the artist. And uh, for uh, the ones who are uh, in Rome, the possibility to walk in an um, ambulatio Maxentiana uh, with uh, Marco Cecini. Uh, in Rome? In Rome, Ooh, wow. Marco is a, an historical reenactor. He interpreted the Emperor Maxentius, and uh, he knows very well uh, where and uh, uh, and uh, the Emperor made uh, all the important decision uh, in his life. So it will be another way to relieve the history of Accentius uh, after reading the, the comic book. Mm, wow, that that would be a truly spectacular experience. Yeah. Well, I want to know, uh, Diego, about about the Roman law stuff, because the, the, the idea of why this is interesting and important historically, that most people in my audience, they might already know, is that we have in uh, the, we'll call it the late Roman Empire, late Western Roman Empire, a, a great change occurs as Christianity becomes more popular, and then it becomes the, the, the common knowledge that, okay, Constantine's the Christian emperor, and Constantine is the one that moves the capital to what we ended up, then he ended up getting called Constantinopolis in the East, and that he brought Christians into the Roman Empire as an accepted class, mainstream. He made the mainstream, we might say in modern parlance. And uh, but then and then Maxentius was his uh, rival and he lost. So that's if anybody knows anything, that's pretty much all I knew before I started learning. But that's a very small part of the story, right? Yeah, sure. The relationship between Constantine and the Christians is uh, what I what what I call uh, Maxentius uh, copyright law and infringement by Constantine, basically speaking. And now we we, we are going to see why. Uh, between uh, 2021 and 2022, we discovered four imperial constitutions, unpublished constitutions uh, dating back to the early fourth century AD. What, and where were they found, by the way? Uh, basically, we found uh, such constitutions in a, a range of a, between 13 and 14 Byzantine and post-Byzantine codices. Wow. Okay, uh, dating back between the 9th and 10th and the uh, 16th centuries uh, AD. So the texts um, have been published for the first time in, as I said before, in two uh, preliminary books and one article. So what um, such texts are all about? Well, the first text we discovered in 2021 is uh, Maxentius Edict of Legality, not Tolerance, Legality, and I explain why, uh, which is mentioned by uh, three Christian bishops. Eusebius of Caesarea, Optatus of Milevi, and uh, Saint Augustine himself. Mm. To quote Optatus, uh, mentioning Maxentius, reporting about Maxentius' policies, Optatus said in Latin, uh, 
tempesta persecutionis per acta et definita est, iubente Deo, thanks God, mittente Maxentio, Christianis libertas est restituta, basically speaking, Maxentius mm. uh, was the first emperor uh, bringing Christianity uh, freedom, basically, legalizing Christianity. Wow. And how uh, he did it. This is very important and crucial point because it shows to what extent Maxentius was a, a brave emperor very brave mm -hmm. emperor basically he acted as a supreme court he quashed uh, annulled uh, diocletian's edict of persecution legally stating the exact opposite of what diocletian had uh, affirmed a couple of years uh, before uh, when Duc diocletian said that uh, jesus was not a god whereas maxentius aff uh, affirmed the contrary jesus his father and the Holy Ghost are the new gods. These are verbatim Maxentius words. And how he did it, how he did it, let's make a step backward. On April uh, 18th, 303, 303, criminal complaints were sent to Rome. The procedure uh, was called Ius Rescribendi Ad Senatum uh, and was the same procedure used by Valerianus and Gallienus a couple of years before to prosecute and persecute Christianity, to condemn Christianity and their worshipping, their cult, because worshipping Jesus was not compatible with the law. Jesus is not a god. But Diocletian said a bit more, because Diocletian said that you, the Christians, are teachers of errors, teachers of mistakes, and you break the law because you violate our constitutional order. Mm. These are Diocletian's verbatim words. So ancient authors <clears throat> report that Christians were persecuted as if by Senate consult, as if by Senate consult. And the Senate, be be why? Because the Senate still retained and preserved its competencies on, one, the admission of new cults. And secondly, on criminal matters such as high treason, which was the, the reason why Christianity was convicted under Diocletian's uh, rule. High treason, in Latin, crimen majestatis. Okay? So Diocletian formally respected the Senate's competencies, and he sent to Maximian Herculius uh, the emperor's report discussing the criminal charges against Christianity. And they were approaching the great feast, Natalis Urbis Rome, because the accusations, the charges uh, were sent between the 18th April and 21st April, mm. the great feast. And, Ma and Ma Maximian Herculis was there. And he was attending circus, um, the, the um, circus Maximus, uh, circus Maximus competitions, when he received the complaints, and he suddenly convinced uh, Hermogenianus, yes, uh, the guy of the Codex, the guy of the Codex Hermogenianus, uh, the author of a landmark in private collection of Roman laws, which was used as the, as the base of uh, to enact the Codex Theodosianus. Here it is, the Circus Maximus, Circus Maximus. And as a perfectus urbis, Hermogenianus was tasked to convene the Senate in order to vote Diocletian's Edict of Persecution. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is Max, what did Max, what Maxentius did? Why he is so important and brave? Because he stated exactly the contrary and he quashed a Maximus Augustus Edict. Mm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So he was accused uh, uh, of high treason uh, after his death. He was mm -hmm. condemned uh, and he was damnatus. So wow. basically damnatio memoria was applied to Maxentius because of this, because he defended Christianity. He legalized Christianity for the first time long before Constantine. Wow, that's impressive. Well, if I remember, Maxentius's reign was short, was it not? Yeah, yeah, but he did a, a lot of a lot of things, a lot of works from uh, the from the from from the laws, such as 
for example, the edict of legality, but also the first ruling against the Donatist, against the Donatist church, a schismatic mm -hmm. church in North Africa. He was the first, and not Constantine was the first to rule against the Donatist. Mm -hmm. A second sample of copyright infringement. Uh, but we we may go on. For example, we may just recall the Basilica, the Basilica of Maxentius, and also the Colossus, but which is not Constantine, Constantine's Colossus. The, it, it actually probably was Maxentius Colossus, and then it was remodeled mm -hmm. by Constantine. Which happened many times where... Oh, the, yes. Uh, yeah, here's, a, here's another one of the not yet painted, yet, not yet uh, colored in. The, uh, the beautiful illustrations we can see what this project will what this book will be like. Well, that's fascinating, uh, Diego. What, what did I want to ask about that regarding, um, uh, oh, in a div an empire with the divisions that there were, how could Maxentius, could he, could he um, do something that would actually have implications for both halves of the empire in that time? Or was that, that only possible later once the empire became really a, a more united entity once again. I don't remember how that, that works with the Senate and the law. Actually, I don't know anything about Roman law practically, so I'd like you to um, inform yeah. me. Yeah, basically speaking, Maxentius, Maxentius was not recognized by, by the Tetrarchy. So territorially speaking, geographically speaking, his edict, edict his, his laws were only applicable to Italy and North Africa. Ah. But there, his works uh, and laws were, believe me, uh, as I said before, landmarking, landmarking. Yeah. Amazing. Well, that's uh, that's amazing. So yeah, it's like um, it's like inventing something without a patent, if in uh, the way that our <laughs> at least the United States patent law works. If you invent something, but you don't have the patent. You can't collect the royalties on it, so I guess it's something like that. He, Maxentius, historically, wasn't able to collect the <laughs> the royalties, the the glory, in all of this. Well, um, I I want to I want to gosh, I would love to, t to talk to you more about the Roman law, but I want to ask uh, Sonia and uh, Francesco about um, how do you. So I, I know you, you work with, uh, of course, the, the, the story, the writing of it, the arranging, and also of the panel layout, right? How do you, how do, you, how do, you do this? Like, like, I don't know. I just see little details like, here, here's, you got his head that's above the edge, and you may just make these decisions. How did you make these kinds of specific decisions to give us some insight into your work? Uh, this was a specific decision made by the artist to make the head of Constantine uh, go above the, the other panel. In my script, there was simply um, a lateral uh, panel with the full figure of Constantine mm -hmm. and uh, uh, near uh, the panel, a latere, <laughs> uh, there is uh, another big uh, panel in which uh, we, we see what Constantinus, Constantine is saying. So um, we see the character, he says something, and then in the lateral panel, we see what he just uh, ordered. And then the artist decide to make him uh, go out of the of the panel, both the like head and the, and the paper. It's, it's great. I mean, I, I like to, I like to interpret works of art. And so I, I just, I can't help but think of the Colossus. That's of course, a part of the illustrated story uh, as well. They standing right out of it like a giant statue and, and yeah. also towering over history itself. It may be sure. a little bit grand, but that's it, how it feels was, to me. This was the idea. This is, um, if I'm not mistaken, the first time we see Constantine in full armor. Mm. And then um, um, we had to show him in all his uh, might and power. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it is the real power of the comics because the story, so the, the plot, uh, the images, um, the words, all works together in the same direction to tell something to people, to say the story, to say the... In this case, I think... Uh, 
I, I would like to point out this because I think it's important for all the readers, both for uh, histor history lovers and uh, comic book lovers. I think that uh, this graphic novel is a real and uh, I may say very good example of a historical novel in comic in this, uh, in this time. Because, you know, um, historical fiction is just a way, another way to said uh, through history in an immersive and captivating way. And uh, whatever you can find uh, in the essay written by uh, Marco and uh, Diego, you can also find here in this comic book, but uh, in a narrative way, in a subjective point of view, under a subjective point of view, and uh, with a lot of color images, uh, we show and um, it's, it's a sort of movie, a movie drawn. Uh, we show um, images, we show the action, the events, uh, the facts, uh, and uh, through di dialogues, uh, through scenaries, uh, we tell the same thing. You can uh, uh, scientifically prove whatever you see in the comic book, whatever is written or, uh, or illustrated, but also you can see it by uh, many points of view. And in this um, way that I hope can uh, entertain, but also leave something to the reader, uh, the curiosity uh, of knowing more about Maxentius. This is uh, a story of... Uh, women and men, it's a story of hate, of love. It's also, it is also a lot of a story about uh, um, father and ch fathers and children, because Maxentius is the despised son of Maximian, but he, he is also himself a father, a loving father of a beloved son like uh, Valerius Romulus. And uh, what happens to Valerius Romulus uh, it's a sort of a driving force for Maxentius to change his uh, way to act, to change uh, the way to rule. And uh, it's important because uh, you will see the events, but also the human driving forces that leads to them. And so I really hope that everyone, history lovers that uh, like reading essays and uh, comic book lovers, that uh, like to read comics can both enjoy a lot this kind of comic even if they don't speak in, uh, latin uh, yeah <laughs> because <laughs> the the comic will be uh, in three languages for the first time we are making um, uh, sure the comic in latin but also in english and in italian so mm -hmm. it's for everyone uh, even for um, history lovers uh, who don't speak latin yeah, because there are a lot of people that uh, uh, love uh, Roman history, ancient history, but maybe they don't speak Latin very well or just don't have the time or the energy to try reading in another language. And so why not uh, let them uh, know better this, uh, this fascinating story? Because it's really, I, I think it's a really a strong uh, events about it. First of all, a man, a person that uh, lived his life and uh, really gave a very strong imprinting in Rome. Maxentius was uh, uh, loved by Romans because he loved Roman ver Rome very much, not just the city, but also the meaning of it. And uh, that's very important, but you will, uh, you will read it. Mm, I, I think that was beautifully said, Sonia, especially yeah. what you said about authenticity and the, the realness of the things that we see here. The, f the first things that we see, as in the other, uh, other books, and Origine Spicta was another one essentially historically based uh, like this one, where so much attention to detail is put into every design, every, uh, you know, every, every character, every archway, the way all of these things look are um, obviously powerfully inspired by our best reconstructions done by archaeologists, reenactors, and others. And 
um, maybe in this illustrated format, one can uh, enjoy at a level of detail that is even higher than one can see pro in things like uh, even the best visual representations like the Rome, HBO, uh, and uh, the Rai and BBC production, which was very high in production values, but very you get to a yet higher level and I, you, everything is constructed here. Everything is visible, all the, the whole uh, Kirkus Maximus. And uh, oh look, there's a dove. I like it. And um, you don't have budget restraint with the comics. <laughs> that's right. You don't have that kind of restraint. Um, and uh, which is is extraordinary. But if, and that's one part of it. And then the story you're telling, which is historically, is uh, based. Indeed, the point of this, the impetus behind it, is to tell about a part of history that has been uh, overlooked. Uh, for many reasons, and thanks to uh, Diego and, and Marco, we're able to work for the first time, all of us in, in the world, to learn about this. And then, of course, the part that I, I most um, um, uh, think about myself, which is the Latin language. We have, of course, if, for one, if one is getting the Latin language version, though it's great that the English and Italian versions are available too, we have that level of authenticity as well. And since, of course, uh, our friend and colleague uh, Stefano Vittori, who's, I mean, who, who better <laughs> to, <actually laughs> yeah. to render this into the best Latin appropriate for the age, you know, quid praetoriani carte. Well, that's actually, I can hear Stefano's voice and I see that. That's too. Which is, and that the, um, uh, yeah, authenticity at every level. And why does that matter? We talked about that on in the uh, interview we did on Scorpio Martianus. Like why why history matters because it gives us such a better understanding of uh, the context of of everything around us. So it's uh, it's uh, critical to learn. Um, boy, I, we're, I I would love to continue to talking in great detail about all of this, but it, before we we get into any. Um, more extraneous questions for me because I want to get into details of Roman law and, and things like that. Um, what else should should we inform uh, the audience about this evening? Well, the, the Kickstarter will last until the end of this yeah. month. Links in the description. Thank you for reminding yeah. me. So it's uh, 31st, uh, I believe, of March. Yeah. That is 31st of March. 31st yeah. right. is the last day of the Kickstarter. Yeah, like being able to take, if you're in, able to be in Italy or Rome and actually get that tour, uh, that would be incredible. That pre sounds pretty cool. That's a, um, that's, which is extraordinary. Or just getting a copy before everyone else is nice. So that people can get them in their classrooms. Um, some people in the, in the, uh, in the live uh, chat were saying, saying that the, they want to get the, that so they can actually have it right away um, <laughs> for their, for their students. Which is great. I mean, th think of about that. You know, you get to be some of the first people to, to at the end uh, on the history. comic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had a, a similar feeling of excitement being able to read some of the text of the first decoded Herculaneum scrolls. Uh, yeah, a couple Ooh. weeks ago, which is, you know, it's just these, you know, it's it's uh it's been buried. These things have been buried literally or figuratively for so long. So to have them revealed is, is quite exciting. They were lost and they're not lost anymore. It's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. Diego, yeah. could, could you? You know, uh, I have something yeah. with Herculaneum. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, her Herculaneum is. No, the, the, I have, uh, I, uh, I love that place and the stories about um, Villa dei Papiri since I was a uh, really little child more or less a little child when i discovered mm. that uh, this existed and uh, it became my dream and my obsession <laughs> since now and i think forever mm. oh, what, so, it's this this is uh, uh you know it was in origines picta a story about the about Herculano. it's my fault <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh well yeah then i just uh me too it was um when Long before I came to Italy, um, my dad would tell me stories about because he got to visit uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum in the 1950s um, when he was uh, studying art in, in Rome and in Italy. And so he got to visit and told me that as interesting as Pompeii was, Herculaneum is where there's much more there and you have more than one story that's been preserved. So you can really enjoy it. And so when I got to I visited. Um, uh, wait, did I remember? Which one did I visit first? I don't recall. Anyway, Herculaneum. 
just blew my mind. Yeah, Hercule I think I saw second, but yeah, it, it just is how much was there preserved and, is, and how much is left to be uncovered. I'm glad the archaeologists are taking their time. As much as I love everything to be revealed at once, it's probably best to take their time to preserve the things as best as possible. Uh, Diego, I wanted to ask about these uh, recently published texts of the of the codices. Uh, could you tell us about those again, where the, these uh, might be accessed? Yeah, sure. Uh, all these texts uh, are uh, open access. So basically, if you uh, look for, uh, for me, Diego Serra or Marco Cecini, you uh, will find us on academia.edu and you will find the texts in, perfectly in open access. It's amazing. Actually, I, and I haven't looked them up, up yet myself. What language were they written? And was it was it Latin still, or were they in, in Greek since they were Byzantine? Yeah, yeah. All the texts, all, all the ancient texts, are uh, preserved in the, in their Greek version. In their Greek mm -hmm. version, and uh, our first book is in Italian. The second, the the article is in Spanish, and the last monograph is in Spanish as well. But in the next months, we are going to publish uh, a, an abridged version of no more than thirty pages uh, in English for uh, targeting a, an Anglo-Saxon audience. Good, and 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 dare I say, an Anglo-Saxon length? We like the the short brief. <laughs> No, and I'm uh, maybe um, maybe I, I speak for for just some some of us, but uh, especially those of us who've, of of uh, my audience who've seen my five hour videos where I talk about one one you know phonology book, so they know that that uh, I'd like the those long original things too, and they're in Italian. That's good, so I can I can go read them. Um, well, this project is absolutely. Uh, beautiful, and I, I can't wait to get my hands on my book. I'm very proud to be among the, the contributors uh, to it. Um, thank you so much for, for being here, and uh, it's um, a, a joy to, to talk with you. And um, if anybody out there seeing this video, either live or uh, after the fact, um, please leave comments below asking whatever you want, specific history details uh, that we can transmit to the experts or if you're interested in in the project itself or or the other new base uh books go ahead and leave your comments there so grazie mille grazie a te. Prego. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you very much grazie thank you, thank you for your time thank you for being here grazie a voi